There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen around the world, wherever you may be. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited to be today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with a lovely young lady by the name of Mandy Morris. Mandy, how are you? I am amazing, of course. Thank you for having me. She is amazing, actually. And let me give you guys her bio. She's an entrepreneur, a philanthropist. I love that word. That's one of those words where it says exactly how it's pronounced. And the reason she's on the show, a manifestation expert. She's the creator of Authentic Living, which is an online company designed to help individuals reconnect with their authentic selves to find purpose peace and deep healing. Mandy and her brands have been featured in a lot of different media outlets like Shape, Mind Body Green, The Chalkboard, BuzzFeed, Well and Good, Thrive Global, as well as on notable podcasts like the Jay Campbell, no, the Jenny McCarthy Show, Your Own Magic and Hungry for Happiness. And I will add the Jay Campbell podcast, of course, to that list. Uh, a very illustrious guest here today, but again, she's a manifestation expert. Um, and that's why we're going to be talking. But as I always do, Mandy, when I bring my guests on the show now, because we're living in, again, however you want to define it, the greatest of times or the most perilous of times, you know, where do you see humanity, planet Earth, Mother Earth, you know, going in the next three to five years? Like what, you know, how do you see things? You know, one of the biggest processes to manifestation for folks who really get it, who understand that they are so deeply connected to all that is and can manipulate it positively, hopefully, is surrender. And I would say, although I always want to be careful with it, it'll be a beautiful thing. Human consciousness expands just like the universe. It's the pain happens when we try to stop the expansion, but it's going to happen regardless, whether we kick and scream or whatever it is. So I feel like in the next three to five years, we're going to see more surrender for those who aren't leaning in right away to the change and understanding what else it can mean and shifting the perspective on it. But that surrender will be um, not forced upon us, but it's beautifully evolving as such. In the last just three days since I've gotten back from Playa del Carmen, um, there's been a lot of people, notable people who are just dying in their sleep. And, you know, it's like, this is what people are talking about right now. So it's kind of interesting that you talk about surrender because, you know, I kind of look at what's happening right now um, as everybody from a soul level is choosing their path. And a lot of people are choosing to opt out, you know, of this time and place, you know, again, as a physical body being an avatar body uh, because of the stress, the, the fear, the pain, the turmoil, you know, however you want to label it. Um, and again, everything is okay. Right. You know, I love to, you know, obviously I have Dr. Hawkins stuff here behind me with the map of consciousness, but you know, he has a statement that everything is happening exactly as it's intended always and in all ways. So it's like, it's our resistance to that knowing or that awareness that causes so much, you know, quote unquote pain and agony in our lives. And it's like, when you start looking at those, everything that's happening now, you know, through this lens, you do realize that this is all okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, society has really programmed us in such a sense that we have to look through this tunnel vision of everything is constantly falling apart. Things are not going to be okay. And this false sense of finality that humanity lives with, if it's not okay today, or if I perceive that it isn't, then that is what it will be, period. And we live and die by that, you know, literally and figuratively. I got to write what you just said down because it's so amazing. This false sense of finality. I love that. Wow. That's powerful. You are a woman of powerfully few words. Okay. (laughs) So let me, let's, so let's talk about, you know, and we can go any direction, but uh, obviously I brought you on here because you're a manifestation expert. What is manifestation for someone, you know, who's heard the, the woo woo term and is, you know, bought books, by the way, you'll laugh at this. Somebody just sent me this book. I get people 
who send me books all the time and say, oh, I think you'll love this. And it's creating money, attracting abundance. And so it's all about manifesting money. So it's just, it's perfect right. timing. But uh, in your opinion, your idea, your mind, the, everything you've learned, what is manifestation? So one of the biggest things, and one of the reasons that I wrote my second book was I wanted to change the conversation on manifestation. Because again, um, accidentally, I would say not to anyone's fault, but society has kind of showed us that manifestation is super woo-woo and it's a, a magic wand and how in the heck do you even do it? And so when I started, I mean, coming from my past and the things that I've experienced and stepping into the space in which I am now and reverse engineering that process just because that's how I'm wired. I was like, this is science. This is psychology. Of course, there's magical, spiritual. I mean, manifestation becomes that where we can literally wave a magic wand. But there are some pieces that humanity is stuck in. And the manifestation process isn't about just creating what we want. It's understanding we are creating all the time. And then understanding the communication we're having with the energy around us or you know, the proverbial universe, if you will. So I call it counter manifesting. So it's that reminder of we are manifesting, we are creating our reality all the time. How do we stop letting that be an unconscious process? So that's what manifestation or the process of it is for me and what I like to teach. Beautiful. Uh, most people are unconsciously manifesting, right? They're, they're constantly putting out negative ideas or thoughts or even precepts where it's like, you know, I, 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 I always love to quantify things by this, but like, you know, the masses, as you just said, the me, you know, the mass media again manipulating the masses like to keep people in the victimhood vibration, yeah. right? And as you know now with social media, and I feel so sorry for younger children, younger people. You know, I have a fourteen and twelve year old daughter. I know you have children as well. You know, the videos that they get from TikTok and from Snapchat and mm -hmm. YouTube and all of this stuff are designed to keep them entrained in a lower frequency which again, teaches them that you don't have to be accountable. You know, it's not your fault. You were born this way. Your parents didn't give you enough or love. So it's crazy how much more difficult, in my opinion, at least it is for younger people of today, because again, they're being so manipulated. And I know you and I and our parents, you know, had the other mainstream manipulators like the boob tube and the newspapers and everything else. There's always like, depending on the generation of people, there's always something that wants to psyop and mass manipulate consciousness. But you're right. Like you have to become accountable for your words, thoughts, and actions. And until you are, you will constantly create, you know, what I like to call negative, you know, karmic boomerangs that you just send out again, unconsciously, <laughs> that come back and serve you in some form or fashion. And it's like, it's mind blowing to believe that, you know, people are not aware of this stuff. You know, you kind of said it's woo woo. You know, everybody thinks about the law of attraction when they think about manifestation and what they've taught from that. But it really does just start at that basic level of like, you know, being very um, proactive and guarded in the way that you speak. And I, I see so many people just, you know, consciously or unconsciously, excuse me, say things without any thought or, you know, or, or process to it. And, and again, it, this isn't stuff that people are learning in grade school these days, right? I mean, that's kind of where we are. Yeah, I've noticed that, you know, when going back to TikTok and, and so forth, it's really funny where a few at least generations are right now, where they're sitting there going, what is this really going to be? What is this really going to look like moving forward? And all of us are like, whoa, okay, we're playing the blame game. And it's it's this process of waking up. But of course, it's always peppered with a little bit of you know societal programming or confusion about the waking up process. But one of the biggest pieces I talk about with manifestation is assuming responsibility. Right. Now, everyone takes that too far and they're like, what? So I manifested this horrible, traumatic you know, experience. And I'm like, I'm not even going to touch on that because again, we're not going into victim mode, but let's step into what is the beliefs that were created from that, that you choose to hold on to today? And why does your life continue to show up as it is? And I, I always tell people, I'm like, if you can be watching this podcast, if you are blessed enough to be able to access this information, if you have a cell phone in your hand, then you have every, every possibility of completely rewiring your brain, of changing your reality, of manifesting whatever you want, because you already have that level of consciousness. You're just looking right instead of looking left. Beautiful. Um, you know, to that, my wife and I like to look at things. I mean, you know, from a soul level though, you know, to that person that, you know, and again, you're not going into that conversation with them, but from a soul level, the answer is yes, you did choose this 
situation or scenario so that you could evolve through the contrast that it provided you. And so it's like, you have to get to a place in your life where you can look back, Mandy, at everything that's happened to you with eyes of compassion, right? Because you realize that they were all the greatest gifts. They were really, truly an evolution of your beingness and your consciousness at the same time, because you wouldn't be who you are from an improvement standpoint if you didn't have that contrast to have to evolve through. And as you know, the biggest stagnation piece or point is that many people never forgive. You know, they they hold on to whatever it is they happened and then they it personifies their existence. Like everything is judged or classified or labeled based on what happened to them. You know, like at that seminar that I was here this weekend, you know, Christiane and Northrop and I were on a stage on a panel uh, in, in front of a couple, I don't know, there's probably like 70 or 80 people there in the conference that attended it in person. There was tons of people on the live stream, but you know, we were sitting there and it was about like, how many of you guys right now can literally say that there is not something that defines you when you meet someone for the first time in your life, right? Cause you think of all aging people, especially, and most people define themselves by like, Oh, I have sciatica in my lower back. And you know what I mean? And like you, 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 you come up with a narrative or a story to define yourself as almost like an icebreaker in conversations with people. Mm-hmm. And it's truly mind blowing. It, if we could deconstruct the stories that we are creating for ourselves and telling other people, we wouldn't be programming ourselves, you know what I mean? To, to create these realities. And it's like, I think about how people age and get sick and, you know, it's perfectly relevant with all the nonsense that's going on right now, but it's like, you're either in a fear of it, which is obviously then from a vibrational standpoint, like, you know, bringing it closer to you. Right. Yeah. Or you're not, and you're in a place of like, you know what, I'm healthy, whole and complete, you know, as a mantra or an affirmation. And you're going through your life and it's not a de- a big deal for you. And even if it is and something happens to you and you do get sick, it's not something that you define yourself by. And I think, you know, I want your comment on that, but I think that that's kind of the biggest issue in life is that something happens to us and instead of letting it go, like you said earlier, surrendering to the idea that it's okay, cool, it served me and its purpose and now it's, it's out of my consciousness, people hold on to it and it then just bogs them down throughout all of life. Well, so there's this saying, and I I have adhered to it so much, and I love it so much. And speaking of traumas, I want to dip into that. Is um, and I always butcher it, and I cannot remember who said it. I should probably know it by now because I say it all the time. (laughs) I'm terrible at that. But it is 99% of people will make a decision, and then they will spend all of their energy afterwards wondering and freaking out and panicking if it was the right decision. Right. But 1% of people will make a decision and spend all of their energy afterwards proving that it was in fact the right decision. And although that doesn't sound very manifestation-esque, that is us empowering ourselves and taking control of our reality and choosing to see things how we see things. And so I, I've talked about this on a couple of podcasts, so um, it's no big deal for me to say it here, but when things really bad, what we were talking about quite a bit ago, when things that are really bad happen, a few months back, my husband and I had a miscarriage and we lost our daughter. And it was blowing people's minds that although, of course, I had my grieving period, the grieving period was maybe a few days. And then it was, oh, my gosh, she's at, you know, my daughter, which wasn't even a girl or a boy, you know, in the in the essence of the energy she came from. She's on such a high vibration that she came down for a moment to remind me of where we're going, right. where it's just the is, the is frequency. And I think that's where people get stuck. And that's a hard one for a lot of people to swallow is how could this horrible thing on the human plane be done by me? Or how could it have possibly been here to serve me? All it's doing is creating pain, but it's because of the perception of what it is. So it maintains this density emotionally talking about um, the, you know, the chart behind you, it maintains the density of the low vibrational emotions. And so we keep re-experiencing the pain of it and not transmuting the darkness into light and seeing what it really should be and what it should become. And so in that moment where I was like, okay, I could go the human route and have every right to, I lost my child. It was extremely traumatic, blah, 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 all these things. I was like, I'm also here to serve humanity and turn darkness into light. And turn density into something that is higher. So if that is me, then what is the new perspective? What else is there available to me? And what could this be saying that I can't like currently see in my level of consciousness? And so really the whole process of raising our consciousness is expanding into all that we are, which eventually becomes just is. There's no bad. There's no good. There's no evil. There's no nothing. There's no light, no dark, no love, no fear. And then there's all of it in between. But it's this incredible state of awareness that 
and as humans, it's hard to access, at least not consistently. I know some people can do it, you know, depending if they maybe do a hallucinogen or if they meditate long enough and so forth. But that's that's not the only place that we're supposed to be as humans. We're also taking that density and bringing it into light. We're taking the, the perceived evil of the world or the things that aren't working correctly. And we're bringing it back to a oneness where it's understood and transmuted into nothing but light, which is just information. Mandy, you are a true master. I mean, that was so profound. I mean, first off, I am like, you just, you know, had a miscarriage and you are at such an advanced conscious level. You know, you saw the opportunity to realize that that soul you know, incarnated for that short amount of time to give you the light and to give you that experience and that awareness. And, you know, she or he, or, you know, again, it's a being, uh, is definitely connected with you still, you know, and your husband, you know, cause obviously he had a role in it too. So, I mean, it's so powerful that there are people out there like yourself <laughs> and that I'm able to speak with you and connect with you. Cause I am also totally at the same level of consciousness as you, you know, I, you know, I, it's it's hard and I'm just admitting it to the audience right now. You know, I, my wife and I have been together when she was 41 and I was 42 and we've been together now 10 years. Um, so we didn't have children together, but, um, you know, we talk about this at times with people and yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, most people cannot consciously, you know, they're not there yet and that's fine. You know, it's, it's not labeling people, but you know, we've, we've talked about this, like when, when babies are born into very impoverished settings with, uh, you know, disfigurement, uh, you know, mental retardation, you know, all these different things. It's still the gift that that soul chose to experience again, to evolve from the contrast of that brutal, you know, reality. And again, a brutal reality is like you said, that's not is that's defining it in linear third dimensional terms. Yes. And so we have to raise our awareness or our consciousness or our state of being to be multidimensional, to come from that neutral observational perspective. I love what you classified as just being, you know, just the is. Yes. And when that transmutes in that way, when you can take those difficult moments, and I've seen, I had this beautiful client who had lost her son and then lost her husband right after. And it was just this crazy time. But when she transmuted all of that perceived density and darkness, and she came back to herself, the person that she was, the life that she could experience because of that transmutation process was so, so incredible, but it's what she did with it what she chose with it. Right. And so we can choose unconsciously to stay in the density and say, this is what this means. I can't get past my pain. And it's, it's not even, although vibrationally and, you know, scientifically speaking, yes, it is a higher level of consciousness. Let's just call it different. Right. I'm just over here and you're just over there right. and we're all perfectly where we're supposed to be. Right. And that's okay. Right. But right. if one in the human plane is perceived as unpreferential, then isn't it supposed to get our attention? Isn't there something that we're doing wrong? Right. If it doesn't feel good, if we're supposed to feel good, or we have the ability to have a preference in this particular plane, because I know that in other planes of reality, we don't even have a preference right? because we don't have access to most of the emotions that humans do. Right. Are you currently suffering from a testosterone deficiency? Are you already using therapeutic testosterone? If you are, go to tottdecoded.com forward slash 10 dash questions and find out the top 10 questions you need to be asking your doctor about therapeutic testosterone. These are critical questions to ask your doctor. If they can't answer them, you need to find another doctor. It's interesting that you say that because you think about why do people choose to deal with the, like to exist in the pain, the struggle. It's like a feel good. You know, my, my wife, Monica likes to say, you know, people are addicted to the trauma of the drama and it's the drama is again, kind of that thing where they get into that place where it's a comfortability. They become comfortable. So certain. Absolutely. I remember being in, in dysfunctional relationships and abusive relationships. And if you ask me consciously, because I was I wasn't like I was certainly born, I'm sure, as we all are with a, a great, you know, uh, awareness, but it got doled out through trauma and pain and sure. choices. And so I found myself in all these really dysfunctional relationships. And if you'd asked me back then, Mandy, you you want this or, you know, don't you want something different? I beg, of course I want something different. I don't want to be cheated on. I don't want to be in these relationships. I don't want to be emotionally shut off, but I did. 
I absolutely did. And when I stopped shaming myself for realizing that that was actually true, that it was me choosing it, that then there was a perceived, perceived being the operative word, there was a perceived reward to the solution that I kept choosing or magically finding myself in. I wanted it. And that's okay. But once we understand what need we're trying to meet, we're meeting it incorrectly and we can meet it in a more elevated way because the need in and of itself is beautiful and it's rooted in a very basic human need, love, connection, safety, whatever, certainty, all that jazz. Then we can evolve past it and we can meet that need in beautiful ways that allow for us to be our most authentic version of us, elevate our consciousness versus consistently create the cycle of pain when we're stopping ourselves from expansion. It's beautiful. Um, you know, I kind of look at it, you know, from my own life, uh, as I've had multiple incarnations. So my current wife is my third wife. My second wife gave me my two beautiful daughters who my current wife and I have been raising. And they're actually have one month left for us. My 14 year old starts high school. Uh, she's totally not veed. So she has to leave California. Now I don't have any options. Uh, and the 12 year old is the same. So my ex is in Florida. So that's going to begin their, their new incarnation and they leave on July 5th. And it's also a great opportunity for my ex and them um, to heal the traumas that they have because she hasn't really been a, played an active role in their life. But I, I, I brought that up to, to explain to you that when I look at my life, you know, all of the things that have happened to me, and again, obviously, I have not been this advanced, right, until I'm 51, and I didn't really become advanced until I was like 44, 45. And so, you know, I was in the ego, I was in the you know, like you said, the the trauma or, or the pain of things and, you know, labeled things by, you know, being stuck in things. So we're all evolving and growing, but like, I've gotten to a place now where I can truly look back and I can say, my soul came into this body, into this physical time and space, imagined physical time and space that to evolve. And, and it was all these things that happened to me, you know, were part of that evolution. And it's like, that is where, you know, and obviously you're, you've had the same thing, you know, abusive relationships and whatnot. Uh, I mean, I attempted to kill myself. I, I you know, I, I've been through some crazy stuff, you know, as we all have, right. It's the dark nights of the soul that tends to evolve us. But I, I definitely know when I look at things now that everything has been the greatest gift. And I couldn't say that Mandy 10 years ago, and I'm sure you couldn't either. And so it's like the whole purpose and process of the soul's journey is to get to a place where you can actually recognize all of these things as you know being gifted to you and to letting go again you said it from the very beginning of the show to surrender you know to the resistance that you have that that's not the case because that's all it is it's resistance there's nothing beyond your internal resistance to is yes and perhaps there is you know lessons that we come as souls to learn but there's also lessons that we could avoid And so sometimes people are like, oh, am I I just supposed to be? Am I doomed, you know, for life? And I'm like, at some point, you just start choosing it. It's not a part of it. You could learn the lesson before you even learn the lesson as you you understand and become aware of your environment and stay in flow. But we got to get you to that space first. Yeah. And and it's a great point. I think, you know, most souls have many incarnations. They have many lifetimes to figure it out right? Like you're literally, you know, the Navy SEALs say, figure it out. That's their statement, right? It doesn't matter. There's nobody getting get blamed. Everybody's life's online, figure it out. So it's like, you know, you have to, over time, learn, as you said, to make better choices. I mean, it really does come down to the idea that you're always personally accountable, sovereign, empowered, but it's up to you to choose to be that person. And again, so many people take such a long time to choose empowerment over victimhood. And that's again, okay. The problem is, is that the mainstream and again, whoever is controlling or, you know, issuing the programming, you know, wants to keep people in victimhood. And maybe that's also, if you really look at this from a multidimensional perspective, maybe that's also good. And that's why we choose to incarnate in the third dimension, because it is a dimension of like, you know, uh, this disunity and dysfunction and all this stuff that, you know, at souls, like you said, in different levels, we don't have. Yeah, absolutely. I remember having this really crazy dream and usually I get information in my dreams. And I had this dream that I was in this room and there were some people who were doing some not so great things to me. And it was every time that I would have a thought, it would immediately manifest. Like I'd be like, I hope they don't do this. And before I could even get the thought out, the frequency was there and they were doing it. And so I woke up and I was, it was one of the most 
it, for some reason, just the energy of it was one of the worst dreams I've ever had. Sure. I woke up my husband and I was like, I feel like I'm losing my mind. And he's an energy healer. And so he goes through and he's like this, I don't mean to freak you out more, but you don't even have chakras right now. And right. this was not in the dream. We're like in real life. Yeah. And I'm like, great. I'm like, so then where am I or what's going on? And I, I've never done a hallucinogen. I have no problems with them, but I was completely sober just for clarity on this story. <laughs> no, I got and, it. and I'm like, what the heck? And so I go into this meditative state and to make a really long story super short, um, I was testing myself. So I went into this room and I could see myself testing on myself, like trying to deliver information to me. And I was like, oh, so even though there was perceived darkness, it was teaching me something about how quickly and how important our thoughts are in the manifestation process. And so many of these lessons, once I was able to shift it and say, it's not a scary nightmare, but what is it? It was able to transmute into light, which for me, light means information. Right. And I was able to get this huge download of the manifestation process. This was years ago and then implement it and to help people with it through learning that. That is amazing. Do you remember? I've had similar experiences, but do you remember like after it happened, like how you started to implement what you learned? Like, was it something that happened? Like it was so life altering that it just literally was like simultaneous, like within the next day you started mapping out things. Yes. So I, sometimes a dream is like specific or a download in general, you right. dream, whatever we want to call them. Um, and then other times it's like a cellular download is what yeah. I call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of those where life just looked different after it was such a cellular shift that I was like, my con like my conscious mind doesn't really need to even do anything with this other than absorb it. So I absorbed it for about a good day or two because I was a little rattled. It was, it oh, was of course, crazy. I was like, that was a lot for me. And so I spent the day just kind of processing self-care, you know, the love. I always say love is the lubricant of light. So if there's too much information, someone's going to implode because as a human, that's really difficult. So we need love to lubricate that. I learned that clinically. Uh, well, I, I found that out clinically and I've been channeling that for years. For some reason, this certain frequency of love I talk about, which is not what humans perceive it to be. It's completely different. Right. It allows for right. massive amounts of information to come right. in without us, you know, imploding. And so... Um, when I look at that, I would, you know, jump back, pour in that love and then process it. And then I think it was like maybe two days later, I was like, okay, speed. And then I learned this huge lesson on speed in the process of manifestation. So it's almost like this, like, uh, those web diagrams we used to do as kids, sure, where sure. there's a station in the middle. And then I just keep adding more to it yeah. because there's someone who's going to understand it in that way. And that's what they need to hear to remember the truth of the human existence. So I want to, you just said a lot of amazing things. You're making, this podcast is phenomenal, by the way. Uh, lo, love is the lubricant. Did you say of light or life? Light. Light. Okay. That's what I thought you said too. And you could yeah. actually put lo, uh, life too. You could use light and life simultaneously, okay. but yes. I want to unpack that. Uh, and I want to go deeper. Uh, and I've never been able to do this on the Jay Campbell podcast. So thank you. I knew that th there was something about you. I don't really know anything about you other than what I read about you when I agreed to do the podcast with you. And I was like, there's something about her. And then I, you know, moved you and you're like, yeah, no problem. And then like, here we are having this profound discussion. <laughs> okay. So back to love. Um, you're right. Most people don't understand this. And the woo woo, you know, community, the new age consciousness has really, you know, aborted this, misrepresented this, like exploded it beyond what most people can comprehend. You know, they think of like hippie commune love when they say love for all of consciousness or unconditional love. And I, I really do want to unpack this because you're the person to talk to about this. So when I went to Peru in 2019 with my wife and two other people, we had on Lake Titicaca, we did a, uh, no plant medicine or anything, just an actual ceremony on the lake with our guide who was an indigenous check one. And which is a, you know, a derivative of the Incans at the, at the Atiplano at night, you know, 18, 19,000 feet, amazing guy. And when he made the ceremony on the lake with, you know, the leaf that's indigenous to that area of the Atiplano, I, I'm not kidding you. I'm, and again, this is nothing for you, but for average people, it's like, you know, whatever, dude. But the lake came alive mm. and kissed all of us. And all of us spontaneously started to cry. Now, two of the people that were with me are not at the level of consciousness that my wife and I or you are, but they're on the path and now much more awake now, three years later than they were then. Um, 
but like, the, you know, we were all crying spontaneously, like literally crying. And, and the guy was like, why am I crying? I, I don't understand this. And, you know, I was attempting to take him under my wing and explain to him what just had happened. But at that point, my cells upgraded. And I literally went from the guy that, you know, kind of like in your life, you know, leaving the clinical world to be who you are now. I went from the health optimization guy to, to the razor vibration guy, like mentally, like psychologically, psychogenically, I shifted and I'm like that guy and all of his quote unquote internet fame and all that shit is dead. It's all about raising your vibration. And I was absolutely going to do it no matter what, no matter how much my team and the people that were behind me were like, bro, you've jumped the shark. You know, you've gone full blown woo woo, your tinfoil, whatever. It was like, no way am I not going to do this. And so I think the best way to describe that aspect of what love really is, is to use the word that the, uh, the indigenous of the, uh, you know, Atiplano, the Incans have, which is called Ani. And Ani really means it's a divine reciprocity for all of life. So when you get to an unconditional form of love or state of being as a person, as a human, uh, you get to a place where like everything is sentient, everything is consciousness, the rocks, the rivers, the trees, the wind, like everything is alive and everything is sentient. So like you have to give that divine uh, reverence to it and then it gives it back to you. And again, that's the word for them. It's divine reciprocity, divine reciprocity. And I swear to you, Mandy, since that day, I have not stepped on a bug. I mean, I literally have no ability to take another life because I definitely have this love for everything and everything. Of course, we all are human and we're frail and we have egos that are, you know, designed to keep us in survival programming. If somebody cuts me off on the road, you know, I'm going to be reactive sometimes and instinctually, you know, to save myself, but I'm, I'm not the same person anymore. And it's just, I think that's the best way to really true describe what unconditional love is. It's like literally having a divine reverence for everything and everyone and to treat it, you know, with everybody knows the gold rule, but it's like living it. It's not just thinking it, it's living it in how you go about your life. I call it the gift of embodiment. And right. it is, so when we were doing, you know, some clinical stuff and folks were like, how are you helping these people with psychosomatic issues so quickly? And I was like, I have no idea. It's just, it's intuitive and it's coming out of me. This was before I had my certifications sure. before nothing. And, um, I remember the psychiatric nurse going, what is it, this energy that comes off of you? And I sat and I, you know, we were talking about it and I was like, if I, there's no word for it, but if I mm -hmm. had to call it a word, it's love. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's unconditional love, maybe, right. you know, whatever it is. And then I learned about this, you know, in later times, because this was why I was like the therapeutic world. I, I love my therapist. I love the psych psychiatrist. I train, I love them. And we agree that it sucks and it's almost impossible to help somebody when you can't show them that you right. care right. when you can't extend that love. And right. so it could be called coherence. It is when you feel the reciprocity, you know, that divine reciprocity or any form even that a human can absorb of this energy, this frequency, this non-judgment, this pure possibility, this, you know, fill in the blank, the isness in small dose form, and I'm able to experience it. Well, then the natural process when you start living in that space is that you give it because you are the embodiment of it. it. You can't help it. It's not like, let me turn it on and off. It's just your beingness and your energetic communication with all that is. Are you using therapeutic peptides? Are you a new user? Maybe an advanced user? Maybe you're considering starting peptides. Highly recommend going to the link right below the peptidescourse.com forward slash 10 dash mistakes and download my PDF and learn what not to do before starting therapeutic peptides. So beautiful. I mean, really, we're not these physical bodies. We are, again, eternal. You know, I like, I like to, you know, go, you know, spurg out and say, you know, we're vibrating atoms and we're standing, if not oscillating, waves of pure conscious energy. And that's, you know, when people see, you know, and you think of ufology and all that stuff, you know, people see all the time, like orange plasmatic balls or, or orbs. And that's really, to me, what a soul or a spirit being in physical form or in third dimensional manifested, you know, visible form is. 
And so it's like when you understand that that's really what you are, you know, when you start touching other beings, human, you know, interfering with human wave fields, what's really coming out is what you said in the very beginning, which is light. You know, it's like biophotonic charges or plasmatic charges. And in those frequencies and filaments of light is the connection of love. And, and, and again, divine reverence and coherence. I love that word coherence, resonance, coherence. And that is the ability to, you know, uplift, to heal, to solve, I mean, really to solve really any issue, you know, I always like to say like, how does a, uh, a vibrating particle get COVID, right? Like the, the, the truth is, is that people physiologically are in fear of whatever it is, or have some sort of spiritual amputation or trauma that never gets healed or, or integrated. And over time, it leads, as you know, to cellular inflammation. And then the cellular inflammation, again, of these physical avatar bodies then creates one of the diseases of aging. And that's really how we die. And it's like, you know, Christiane and I were talking about programming your cells as you age. You know, you can say, oh, I'm healthy, whole and complete, and I'm going to live until I'm 200 years old. Or you can say, you know, I'm 44 and I'm not as healthy as I once was. I'm not as spry. I've got sciatica. So it's like we define who we are, again, by the words our thoughts, and then of course our actions. Yeah. And so it's like you're programming yourself at all times. Yes. So going all the way back to the beginning of our conversation where you were talking about people who say, you know, they're aging and they're not aging well. And then going into what you just said that, you know, the body is made up of atoms and they're just vibrating. And yeah. what makes those atoms come together in density? Our consciousness. Exactly. So of course, and of course me talking about psychosomatic illnesses all the time, Of course, where we direct our consciousness is going to manipulate the matter. And we are a part of the matter in which we manipulate through our consciousness. So, of course, we're going to age funky or have different ailments or things can happen in those ways as well at times because our consciousness is not flowing in the direction that is, I say, you know, authentic to the true version of us or certainly isn't the highest form. To that, it's an interesting question for someone like you. Does allopathic medicine really just ultimately lead? And, and again, not people like you in allopathic. And I know, thank God, there are no, there are many, many people now that have come out of allopathic, you know, and even functional and wellness and holistic healers and stuff. But does allopathic medicine actually ultimately, you know, from a real just quick answer, is it leading to our physical demise more so than it's helping us heal? Of course. Yeah. 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 I mean, and you've got to think about it. I always say, I'm like, I am so glad that if I chop off my arm, there was someone there that knows how to sew it. (laughs) If you get shot by a shotgun and you're bleeding out, there's a surgeon that can fix you. Yes, absolutely. And my family um, is doctors and nurses and so forth. And you'd be surprised how much we actually agree on many things, but whether it's uh, emotional, mental, or physical, whenever we're treating something by treating the symptoms, right. Or we're, you know, I call it the branches and we're not going to the root, then we are creating more and more symptomatic issues that we can't even understand where they came from or why they're happening. It's like, if I have a headache, I can take an aspirin, sure. Or I could take it two steps further and understand why I have the darn headache in the first place. And it could have been, I needed to drink one more glass of water and a, that was it. But instead I'm taking, you know, you know where I'm going with this, but yeah. No. Oh, I mean, I think of, I, I I think of, and by the way, this is such a profound conversation because we're not really talking on your bullet points, but we're still making a lot of great points. I, I think of like the damage that the Rockefellers to, to blame like one group of family did like to allopathic medicine and with big pharma and all this stuff. But I mean, I'll give you an example of what you just said. Like I get messages from people all the time and they're like, Hey man, I got this so-and-so, you know, this doctor or a urologist or an endocrinologist or so-and-so, and they diagnosed me with this. What do you know about it? And then I, you know, if I'm in a good mood, I'll write them back and tell them, you know, a lot of stuff scientifically about blah, blah, blah. And then they'll be like, oh, well, what do you think I should do? Or like, you know, I'll be like, well, I just told you, you know, you need to investigate this and figure out like why it is, you know, as a being that you're having this issue. But yeah, they, instead, most people, they just want to go to the next specialist. And I think about what you just said. And now like, okay, so the urologist gave him a likely diagnosis, but he's not qualified to truly look at it. So now you got to get it on in the system, Mandy, of the next specialist. And now they're waiting two months with COVID and this nonsense of the last two years. Some people are waiting half a year. Imagine what happens to them psychosomatically. (laughs) 
as they now go to bed every night thinking, oh my God, I have this. Yeah. They're so afraid and there's so much fear. And of course that feeds our cells. I mean, yeah. it, 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 it creates the issue. Yeah. Whatever doctor you go to, they'll still tell you that stress is not going to help whatever issue they're dealing with. So that's one thing everyone can agree on. Um, it's, it's that, fa that fear base. And then when we give our power away a little bit too much to answers outside of us and we lose our truth in anything in life, you know, roping it back to, to the psychology of things, uh, it's just, it's, it's never a good place to be. It's insane. I mean, think of like to go deeper, think of all the people, you know, in their late forties and up who are brainwashed into getting all of these exploratory procedures done every year which are not needed other than they tell you that they're needed because, you know, if they find something, Mandy, it could become, <laughs> so, I mean, I think about like, you know, and I'll just use colonoscopies, you know, mammogram. I mean, all of these things are insane. They're so insidious because then the person literally is like, well, what should I do? And then of course, what do you think the doctor's going to do? This is how they make money. It's how they get they paid. Well, you know, it could become a cancer. So we recommend you tear it out or surgically remove it or excise it. And then it's like, oh my God. The whole system is built on this. And then all of that like, going to consciousness, the consciousness is then focused on, I am unwell, I am unhealed. I mean, yeah. and when we look at, I remember hearing this study um, about these monks who were um, right. meditating over this woman who had a tumor. And in real time, they did have her, you know, hooked up where they could see the tumor. And in real time, the tumor shrunk. But what were they saying? They were chanting already done or, already you know, something done. to that. Like, as in, there's no healing needed. Right. It's not That's even right. there. That's right. That's exactly right. And if you can get to that place of consciousness and awareness where, you know, you have that regular daily meditative, introspective, contemplative, even if it's just sitting in nature and stillness work, you can reprogram everything. I mean, again, your cells are totally programmable by your thought processes and your beliefs and your knowing. And it's so crazy how you said, you know, you said it. And again, you, you know better than anybody, like this society that we live in is programming people to externalize their power, to totally give their power away at every stretch of the imagination between their doctor, you know, their personal trainer, their dietitian, the newscaster, the celebrity, the athlete. It is unbelievable how much and how easily people disempower themselves. Yes. I'm always looking at that. And that's uh, one of the things that I, I actually teach to my, like my coaches or whenever I am working with a celebrity or whatever it is, I'm like, how do I make sure that, that they never think that they are above or below anyone that they are teaching, that they are facilitators of right. someone's personal experience and growth, because it is such a, an ugly place to be when there isn't humility and an understanding that I don't know any more than, than Joe Schmo down the street. I just know differently. And let me share what I know, but let me not be like the giver of truth. Yeah. Amazing. All right. So just to, to, to wrap up um, with a couple of things, and then, you know, you can tell people how they can connect with you and stuff. And obviously I want to talk to you after the show uh, personally. Um, some myths or misunderstandings. We kind of covered a lot of different ways about manifestation, but just, you know, and then, you know, tie it in managing psychological triggers by using manifestation. Yeah. Um, that was one of the biggest things that I learned within myself, because again, I had programmed myself or been programmed, whatever we want to call it for quite some time to, um, think that the sky is constantly falling. So that, you know, false sense of finality was totally me. And as much as I would try to change my life, nothing changed, or it was what I call the roller coaster effect. Things are, are getting better. And then I would sabotage because it was too good. And then I would slap back down to my basement and start the process all over again. And so managing triggers is really in essence, managing where you put your consciousness. It's managing where you put your energy and stopping the flow of energy, whether that's, you know, thinking about it neuroscientifically. So we're stopping the neurological pathway from continuing sure. to fire as such, but more importantly, we're just stopping the flow of consciousness in a direction that is not serving us. So instead of us going, that's something I don't want. Now I'm thinking about the thing I don't want. We're like, that thing doesn't even exist or we've desensitized it to a point that it doesn't evoke an emotion from us because emotions are one of the first units of consciousness. It's the way that it directs everything. So if it doesn't pull an emotion from us, therefore it's not in resonance with us, it doesn't exist for us. So the idea of you know managing the psychological triggers or you know energetic triggers, whatever we want to call them, is just stopping the flow of energy to where all of our energy is going into one space that we do desire and we're no longer unconsciously feeding what we don't want. Unbelievable stuff, man. You are, 
a powerhouse of information and just awareness. And again, I'm so grateful that you came on here to show the show today to share um, really your knowing because it is a very broad and deep knowing. Um, if people want to work with you, podcast with you, connect with you, you know, how, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, I would say the easiest way right now, I don't do any one-on-one work, but again, I've got thousands of practitioners. They're amazing. Would love to connect people to them, but I'm still driving everyone to just mandymorris.love. That's where you can kind of get to know me, contact my team and, and see if anything resonates. That's amazing. So I put all of her stuff up, you guys, uh, on screen here at the end. And of course, in the show notes, when the podcast runs, uh, all of her information and her links will be in there. Mandy, again, I am extremely grateful and privileged and humbled and honored to have you here today on the show. So guys and gals who watch the Jay Campbell podcast, of course, always support the amazing people who come on. Go to her website, mandymorris.love. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.